Yes. So moving on, we have finally reached the end of our series on the Feast of the Lord. And, and so that means next week we're going to start something different. I'll probably go back to John and continue to work through John for a little bit. But um, today is the last of the feasts. And the feasts, as we study them, it's important to remember that in Israel they are observed. In Jesus they are fulfilled. And in us they are applied. And so with that, we're going to do a test. And as we do our test, I was wondering, is there any brave volunteer that would like to come up on stage and take the test. Anybody, somebody, some brave soul. Mary, are you volunteering? Herman wants to? Come on up here, Joy. All right. And, and so, Joy, I have a strawberry Laffy Taffy for you, just for participating. And so you can give it to your daughter, because I know you don't want it. Okay. Oh, you're looking at my notes. Yeah, my notes are right there. So Passover is? Redemption. Unleavened bread is? Excellent. First fruits is? Glorification. Why didn't you? Yeah, it was like my kidney stones, just waiting for the right time, and it passed. <laughs> Thank you for laughing. Weeks is? No? What happened at the Feast of Weeks? Pentecost. The Holy Spirit fell, yes. Trumpets is? Rapture of the church, very good. And atonement is? Last week's message? Israel's redemption. Israel's redemption. Very good. Excellent. Excellent. It's important to remember and to understand what the feasts are because, because as we read through the Bible, if you read through the Old Testament, these things are referenced time and time and time again. And it's important to understand not just not just that these feasts were celebrations for Israel, but they are for us applications in our life. And when it talks about Passover, it's talking about the day that Jesus freed us from bondage. When unleavened bread is mentioned, it's, it's about removing sin from our life and God's promise to continue to help and walk us through that process of removing sin from our life. And, and today we're going to talk about the Feast of Tabernacles. And the Feast of Tabernacles is mentioned several times throughout the Old Testament. And so it's important to understand what these things are talking about so that when you do read through the Bible, because I'm assuming you do read through the Bible, that as you read through it, you will see these things and you will be able to know what they are. And one of the things that's so amazing about this this series on the feast of the feast of the Lord is person after person after person has come to me and said I've never heard anyone teach on the feast of the Lord I had no idea what these things meant or how beautiful they were or how valuable they were to us and so some of the things though about the feast is you'll notice that not everything that was observed about the feast is written in the Bible. And, and I think there's two reasons for that. And one example is, is at Passover, they have four cups of wine. Nowhere in the Passover scriptures does it say that they're going to have four cups of wine and, and that those four cups of wine would be named. But the third cup of wine is that of sanctification, which Jesus, or the, the, the cup of redemption, which when Jesus said, do this as often as you do this in remembrance of me, he was referring specifically to the cup of redemption, saying that when you drink this cup, do it in remembrance of me. And I think there's two reasons why things were added to the feast. 
that aren't in the Bible. One, I think God said many things to Moses that Moses didn't write down. But Moses passed those on through oral tradition, informing the people what was expected and what else to do during that time. And the second thing is that different things happen throughout the, the history of Israel. And the Lord spoke to them and said, I want you to add this to these feasts. And today as we study the Feast of Tabernacles, we're going to look and there are going to be two things that happen that aren't necessarily recorded in Scripture to do. But we're going to, they celebrate and observe those anyway. So turn with me if you would in your Bibles to Leviticus 23. Starting in verse 33. The Lord said to Moses, Say to the Israelites, On the fifteenth day of the seventh month, the Lord's Feast of Tabernacles begins, and it lasts for seven days. The first day is a sacred assembly. Do no regular work. For seven days present offerings made to the Lord by fire, and on the eighth day hold a sacred assembly and present an offering made to the Lord by fire. It is the closing assembly. Do no regular work. These are the Lord's appointed feasts, which you are to proclaim as sacred assemblies for bringing offerings to the, made to the Lord by fire. The burnt offerings and the grain offerings, sacrifices and drink offerings required for each day. These offerings are in addition to those for the Lord's Sabbaths and in addition to your gifts and whatever you have vowed all the free will and all the free will offerings you give to the Lord. So beginning with the 15th day of the seventh month, after you have gathered the crops of the land, celebrate the festival to the Lord for seven days. The first day is a day of rest, and the eighth day is also a day of rest. On the first day you are to take choice fruit from the trees and palm fronds, leafy branches and poplars, and rejoice before the Lord your God for seven days. Celebrate as a festival to the Lord for seven days each year. This is to be a lasting ordinance for the generations to come. Celebrate it in the seventh month. Live in booths for seven days. All native-born Israelites are to live in booths, so your descendants will know that I had the Israelites live in booths when I brought them out of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. So Moses announced to the Israelites the appointed feasts of the Lord. <coughs> so as, as the 15th day of the month would come, you would begin to see scattered all throughout the area, about a half a mile from the temple, these little booths set up. And they had to be a half a mile away or less because the first and the last day were Sabbath days, and according to the traditions of man, you were not allowed to walk more than half a mile on those days or it was work. And so they would get all of these, all, they would shove within this half mile about 100,000 people in these little booths that were made, and they were just two or three walls that were just kind of standing and with some, some palm fronds on top and things like that, just just enough to block out the sun. And as the shofar would sound on the 15th day of the month, everyone would make their way to the temple for the feast. And this feast was different than every other feast because this feast was called to be a celebration. All the other feasts were to be observed and things were supposed to happen, but this feast, this feast was a celebration to the Lord. And so they would come, they would, they would, they would blow the shofar and everyone would begin to go up to the temple. And, and they would get thousands and thousands of people and people would be lining the streets trying to get as close to the temple as possible so that they could be as, part, as close to the action as, as they could, as, part, as much a part of everything as as they could possibly be. And then, the celebration would begin. 
And they would get palm fronds and, and they would wave them they would wave them before the Lord and they would just begin to sing and they'd begin to dance and, and, and they begin to just have this huge celebration. I often thought, man, us Baptists really needed to go back and to teach them how to worship the Lord. We do it the way I think God intended it, you know, with our hands in our pockets and our feet firmly planted on the ground. But, but they would dance before the Lord for hours and hours and they would sing and they would sing these songs of salvation that they had. Specifically, they'd sing the songs of the Hallel, which um, I believe start with Psalm 113. And they would sing these songs and dance and celebrate. And so the first thing that they would do is they would celebrate, but, and the reason they did is because that was how you celebrated the presence of God. And if you think forward to several years later after, you know, after they started doing this, Jesus entered into Jerusalem. And everyone began to wave palm fronds in front of him and place them on the ground before him. And they began to shout, Hosanna, save now. Singing songs of salvation before the Lord. Because even though it wasn't the season and the day of the Feast of Tabernacles, they understood that this was how you celebrated God's presence. And they were expecting Jesus to come in to Jerusalem and to claim his throne. But they misunderstood his purpose. So after they would sing and dance, after a while of singing and dancing, they would have this huge temple lighting ceremony. And the temple had these huge candelabras that they would light. And it would light up the temple area to such a point that you could see it from miles away. And the singing you could hear from miles away. And the reason they would light these huge um, these huge candelabras. Turn with me, if you would, in your Bibles to Second Chronicles. And that's different than Second Corinthians, which is in the New Testament. Chronicles is in the Old Testament. It's uh, after First, Second Kings, First, Second Samuel, then you have First, Second Chronicles. First, Second Chronicles, Second Chronicles, chapter seven, if you can make it there. Starting in verse one, it says, "When Solomon finished praying, fire came down from heaven and consumed." The burnt offerings and sacrifices and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. The priests could not enter the temple of the Lord because the glory of the Lord filled it. And when all the glory of the, when all the Israelites saw the fire coming down and the glory of the Lord above the temple, they knelt on the pavement with their faces to the ground and they worshipped and gave thanks to the Lord saying, He is good, His love endures forever. And this actually happened on the first day of the Feast of Tabernacles. Because if you look down to verse 8, it says, So Solomon observed the festival at that time for seven days, and all Israel with him, a vast assembly, people from Lebo Hamath to the Wadi of Egypt. On the eighth day they held an assembly, for they had celebrated the dedication of the altar for seven days and the festival for seven more days. And on the twenty-third day of the seventh month, he sent the people to their homes. Joyful and glad in heart for the good things the Lord had done for David and Solomon and all the people of Israel. On the 23rd day of the seventh month is the day that the Feast of Tabernacles ends. And so on that day, Solomon sent them home. This happened on the first day of the Feast of Tabernacles. God's Spirit came down and it came down in such a such a huge, I, I love it, it says Solomon finished praying. And as soon as Solomon finished praying, fire fell from heaven, the presence of God fell from heaven, consumed the offerings, and his presence was so incredible. The light from his presence was so great, it says that nobody could enter the temple. And so what the Israelites would do is, is every year when they would gather on this day, 
And every day they would have this huge temple lighting ceremony. Every evening as the sun would set, they would light the candelabras. And they would divide up the court of women so that they would section it off so all the women had an even smaller spot that was way off to the side because there was more men because only the men were commanded. And the men would do what men do when there's lots of fire. They would start playing with fire. And I think it's important that they sectioned off the women because once the women are sectioned off from the men, we are free to, to be stupid because that's what we do when we're not around our wives. And a couple of wives are saying amen to that. Oh my gosh. And the men are like, dude, I'm not stupid when my wife's not around. And the wife's like, I know, you're stupid all the time, but... <laughs> It's just part of the, the Y chromosome. I mean, you know, I don't know. We, we just can't help it. But, but we get, they would get together and they would start dancing with fire. And all the guys would grab torches and they would start dancing and, and flinging the torches around and, and having a great time before the Lord and then coming home without eyebrows and missing hair and things like that. <clears throat> but they would worship the Lord by dancing with fire and celebrating the day that the presence of God descended at the temple. And the next thing they would do is they would have a water ceremony that, that really comes, um, comes from Isaiah chapter 12 verse 3. It says, from the wells with joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. Because in Israel, right after this time, begin the rainy season. And something you may not know about Israel, but Jerusalem in the is area of Israel gets as much rainfall every year as London, England does. But Israel gets it, 85 to 90% of it, in a two-month period. The two months immediately following this feast. And so it would become a celebration and a recognition of their reliance on God to bring water. And so the priests would go down to the pool of Siloam and, and they, would, they would get some water out of the pool and they would carry it to the temple making sure not to spill any of it. And, and people would follow behind and everyone would be watching and, and they would pour it onto the altar. And as they did, they would quote that verse. And they would say, with joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. Ah, I was missing a page. This feast will be fulfilled in Jesus. It will be completely fulfilled in Jesus when Jesus comes to reign on earth for a thousand years. Revelation 24 says that they came to life and they reigned with Jesus for a thousand years. And, and this is important because this is part of a promise that was made to Abraham. God told Abraham, I want you to look out and I want you to see this land. This is the promised land. Someday I'm going to give this land to your descendants and they are going to live here and they are going to possess this land and they are going to live in peace in this land. And as of yet, the Israelites have never possessed that land to live in peace. They came in and they took good portions of it, but they never ever sent the inhabitants of that land out. And so this promise has never been fulfilled. And so God promised Abraham certain things are going to happen. And someday he is going to fulfill this promise. He is going to come back and he is going to establish his throne in Jerusalem. He is going to come down from heaven in physical form again. And he is going to set up his, his temple, his throne room. And he is going to reign over all the earth from Jerusalem. 
And in Zechariah, Zechariah makes reference to this. Oh, that's Jeremiah. I'm not going to find it there. One of those ayahs. Zechariah 13, 14, my bad. It says, Then the survivors from all the nations that have attacked Jerusalem will go up year after year to worship the King, the Lord Almighty, and to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. If any of the people of the earth do not go up to Jerusalem to worship the King, the Lord Almighty, they will have no rain. If the Egyptian... Do, if the Egyptian people do not go up and take part, they will have no rain. The Lord will bring on them the plague He inflicts on the nations that do not go up to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. They will be punished. There will be punishment of Egypt and the punishment of all the nations that do not go to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. They understood that someday God was going to fulfill this promise. And as he reigned from Jerusalem every year, every nation would go before him and bow before him and worship him. And if they didn't, the punishment was going to be no rain for that season. So their crops wouldn't be able to come in. And their people would begin to go hungry. But everyone who came and bowed before him and worshipped him they would, they would be blessed with rainfall and crops and provision. <clears throat> tabernacles? Tabernacles is God's presence. They were celebrating God's presence. And this, this feast has been partially fulfilled already. I believe it was partially fulfilled at the birth of Jesus. I believe that at his birth, he was born on the first day of the Feast of Tabernacles. I have no proof of that, but it just seems to make sense to me that a God of order, a God who has established days to celebrate certain things, would allow us to celebrate that on the day that he had already said that it was going to happen. In tabernacles, a couple of times in the Bible it says he tabernacled among his people. Tabernacling just means to live with. It's also It was also partially fulfilled in Jesus and, and Jesus made a point of, of, of speaking these things it was fulfilled because as the, he is the source of living water. In John chapter 7, John chapter 7, it says, On the last and greatest day of the feast, Jesus stood and in a loud voice, he says, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, streams of living water will flow from within him. And by this he meant the Holy Spirit, whom those believed in him were later to receive. If you could imagine, in the middle of this sacred ceremony, as the priest is, is bringing this water up to the, the, the um, altar, getting ready to pour it, and everyone is watching with bated anticipation, anticipation Jesus right as he's getting ready to pour it, shouts out and says, no, no, I am that living water. And he makes it, and he claims for himself to be God's presence among them. And they understood exactly what he was claiming because they were angry about his claim. They were angry, I mean, the first of all was how dare you interrupt this sacred moment as we're getting ready to do this. And then, seriously, you want to call yourself the source of, of living water? You want to call yourself the one who will provide that well? 
so that joy will flow from within us? You see, that's who our Jesus is. He is a source of living water. And as that source, when we come to Him and drink, we are to have streams of living water flowing from within us, flowing out of us. And the next thing that he partially fulfills is that he is the light of the world. And in chapter 8, <coughs> chapter 8, as, as they're lighting the candelabras, Jesus says, I am the light. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Jesus says, that's me. I'm back in my temple. Just like you celebrated how God's glory fell and his presence came and, and lived among you and dwelled among you, I'm here again. And I'm the fulfillment of this and everything you hoped for. And while these have been partially fulfilled and they're waiting to be fulfilled, they are applied in us. And that we serve a God who fulfills His promises. And I know for most people that's, that's no surprising word. But it's an important one because we often forget that we serve a God who fulfills His promises. Because the feasts are God's promises to us. And when we come and we read these things, and we read that Jesus says that, that He will be a well, or that, that if we come to Him, if we're thirsty, that a spring of living water will flow, from out, flow out of us. That is a promise that He makes to us based upon the fulfillment of this feast. Jeremiah, Jeremiah said, my people have committed two sins. It's Jeremiah 2.13 for those keeping score. He says, my people have committed two sins. And I think we're often guilty of the same two. He says, they have forsaken me, the spring of living water. And they have dug their own cisterns. Broken cisterns that cannot hold water. So there were two ways that the Israel, or three ways that the Israelites got water. One of the ways is they would build these big cisterns so that whenever it rained, it would catch the water. But it was the most unreliable source of water they had because if you leave water sitting long enough, it begins to go bad when it becomes stagnant. And so it was the most unreliable source that they had. They also had they also had wells that they could dig. But there were also streams that bubbled out of springs or little brooks. And those were the most consistent source of water that they had. Jesus says that he is like one of those springs that just has an eternal supply of water for us. But so often we commit the two sins that the Israelites did. We forsake that spring of living water. We get dry, we get thirsty. And we begin to think, you know what? I can do this on my own. We begin to think, you know what, maybe I don't need to spend time with Jesus this morning to start my day. I can do my day today on my own. I can go to work and deal with all the annoying, irritating, selfish, self-centered people at work, and I don't need Jesus to get through a day with those people. And 
and we think, you know what, maybe, maybe I, can just, I can do my finances on my own. I, I, I can fix my marriage on my own. I can deal with all these things. I don't need Jesus every day of my life. I'm gonna, and we forsake the well of living water, the spring of living water that is already within us. And we build these broken cisterns to try to deal with how to do everything. And every now and then we get thirsty and we think, man, I need some strength. I need something to help me get through this day. And instead of going back to that spring of living water within us, we go to our own broken cistern where the water is stagnant and no good and we begin to drink from it to try to find our strength within ourselves. This feast is a promise of God's presence. And Jesus said, once you come to me, Here's my promise to you. There will be a spring of living water that wells up within you and flows out of you. Truth is, is we cannot do it on our own. We still try. We try and we try and we try. We try to do it on our own. I don't know why. I know every time I try to do it by myself, it becomes a huge mess and I have to go back to God and say, can you help me clean this up? And he does. To the promise, the promise that Jesus wants to fulfill in us is that we won't have to thirst again. That we won't be dry in a weary land. And it is so important that we understand this truth because we live in a dry and weary land. And it is our vision statement that we will be hydration for the soul. And the only way that we can be hydration for the soul, for other people, is if we are daily relying upon the spring of living water within us. I believe God is getting ready to do an awesome work. I see the beginnings of it. see the beginnings of things that God is starting to do. I see in people a belief that God is going to use them to do something that they would have never done before. It's just the beginnings of what God is about to do. But you see, we get this idea. We get this idea that, that we need something else. One of the pastors in town said, yeah, we're going to have a revival at our church. And, and pastor, why don't you come bring some of your people and you can teach one time. And I'm like, well, I'm going to show up and I'm going to teach, but I don't think you're going to like what I have to say. Because nowhere in this book is the word revival that I can find. There's a lot of re-words, but revival is not one of them because we never lost, we never lost what God has given us. There's renewing, there's redemption, there's repentance. But there's not revival because we don't need to be revived. We've already been vived. It doesn't have to be a reviving. Because we have within us a well, a spring of living water that is flowing and flowing out of us whenever we tap into that source. And the only time that it isn't flowing out of us is when we need some of the other re's, which is renewing, repentance, or whatever the other one was. <laughs> repentance was the, the, renewing and repentance were the two I was thinking of. I couldn't remember where the other one came from. That just kind of jumped in there. I was like, whoa, where did that come from? So it wasn't in my notes. <laughs> Sean's just about to fall off the pew. <laughs> but we have within us that spring. We don't need to have a revival meeting. What we need to have is a repentance. 
For Lord, I am so sorry that I have forsaken you, that I have not drawn from that well, that spring of living water that is within me, that I've tried to do these things on my own. Lord, I've tried to grow this church on my own. I've tried to share with my friends on my own. I've tried to do my ministry on my own. Heck, I, I've tried to do all these things. I've tried to live my life on my own. What I need, Lord, is repentance and renewing of my spirit because I already have all of the things within me that I need. And when we hit that point, and that renewing begins to happen again, that's when our times will become times of celebration. Have you ever watched people, especially after they first come to the Lord, and they're just annoying sometimes? They're so full of the Holy Spirit and so full of joy. They're just, they, they can't stand, stand still and they want to tell everyone they know about Jesus and, and they, they, they want to do this. And, and they're like, man, I'm going to go to D.C. because I'm going to go talk to the president and tell him uh, that God has a plan for his life. And you're like, dude, sit down. And then they do. Because they were like, wow, I got this, this fire and this passion within me that no one else has. Maybe Christians aren't supposed to have that. And so then they're like, you know, you know they, 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 they try to tone it down and tone it down. Revival is untoning that thing down. It's being renewed in your spirit and coming to a place where when you begin to worship God, you can't stand still. When you begin to sing his praises, you have to pull your hands out of your pockets and sometimes, sometimes even lift them in the air because you're so excited about what he's doing. And it is really okay to dance in church and dance before the Lord. Because you're not doing it to draw attention to yourself. You're doing it as an expression of your love for him. I want to call us to renewal, not revival. We don't need revival. We need renewing. I want to call us to the promises that God has given us because He will fulfill His promises. He will fulfill them in us and He will fulfill them in others around us. Let that fire and passion come. Drink in that fire and passion and become the oddball in church. Become that guy that just can't hold it in any longer. And let that spring of living water flow through you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, as we come before you this morning, we are so excited about your truth and that you are a God who answers promises who fulfills promises. Lord, and your promise to us is that we would never be thirsty. Your promise to us is that we would never lack joy. And Lord, our lacking is not your lacking. It is because we commit the same two sins that Israel did. We forsake you And we try to do it ourselves. Father, I pray that you would renew us, bringing us to repentance. Lord, that you would break us of the strongholds that you have already freed us from. And Lord, that you would fill this room with a fire and a passion that is so bright, Lord, that people cannot come into this room because there's so much of your presence here. And Lord, may that fire begin within each and every single person in this room. Lord, may we long for those days where, where stories are told of the great things that you do. 
And may they be done through us. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen.